Now, we've already talked about the fact that we are always going to be sampling an echo. And we've discussed the idea of a spin echo. Right? So a sp in order to turn this into a measurement of a spin echo, what do we have to do? We have to add a 180 degree pulse. Where? Somewhere after the 90, but exactly where? Can you tell me? Before the TE. Somewhere before the TE. Can anyone be more specific? It has to be, exactly. It has to be halfway between the 90 and TE. Because remember, with the spin echo, we generate our signal. There's some amount of dephasing. The 180-degree RF pulse reorders those spins. And in the same amount of time that elapsed between the 90 and the 180, we will recover that magnetization following which there'll be further dephasing. So the peak of the echo will be exactly at TE only when the 180-degree RF pulse is symmetrically placed in between the 90 and TE. Okay. And typically, Right, the way these pulse sequences are designed is that we place our phase encoding gradient in between right, the 90 and the 180. Okay. Now once we've done all of this, we have sampled enough signal to fill the first row, the first line of k-space. And we know that in order to generate an image, we have to now go back and do this again, making one change. Right? The change we have to make is to use a different strength of the phase encoding gradient. Everything else is the same. Okay? Everything else is the same. The time between that first iteration and the second iteration, meaning how long we wait after TE until we get back to 90, is of course TR. So this is a spin echo pulse sequence. Now if you look at the diagram in there for the spin echo pulse sequence, you'll notice a couple of other sort of nuances. One is that I've indicated that the 180 degree RF pulse is also slice selective. Okay? And that's typically the way this is done. Now you would think, well, it doesn't really matter, right? Because once we generate our signal, we do slice selection with our 90 degree RF pulse. The only signal that we will be detecting is coming from the slice. So when we then give the 180 degree RF pulse, certainly it has to affect the spins in the slice, otherwise we're not doing anything. But what's really the difference whether that 180 degree RF pulse is applied with or without the slice select gradient? Well, it's true, it really won't affect the signal that we detect at TE. The reason why we make these slice selective is that that 180 degree RF pulse affecting other areas, assuming we're eventually going to be interested in short order in imaging slices in those other locations, is going to have effects on the type of signal we detect when we image those adjacent slices. So the main reason to make this a slice selective RF is because of the impact on other slices. Okay. Now something else you'll notice is that 
these slice select gradients have this other little thing hanging off on the right hand side. And what this represents is an application of that same slice select gradient that we turned on to select our slice with the opposite polarity. Okay. Why would we want to do that? Anyone? Doesn't that have something to do with filling up the other half? Nope. Nope. You mean the other half of K-space? Yeah. No. Because remember, during this one iteration, we only fill a single line of K-space. The difference from line to line in K-space is only the amplitude of the phase encoding gradient. And by definition, each line of K-space has to be filled by a totally new iteration of the pulse sequence. Is it to retain back the phasing or defaze? Is it to retain back the defacing defaze? Right. So any time you turn on a gradient magnetic field, what happens? Adjacent spins precess at different frequencies. You lose net transverse magnetization, which means you lose signal. So gradient magnetic fields are, in a sense, a double-edged sword. You need them. We can't do any spatial localization without them. But whenever you turn them on, you are destroying some of your signal. And by turning the same gradient magnetic field on with the opposite polarity, we are applying the opposite effect to our spins. Whereas before, you know, these guys would spin, would precess a little faster than the one shown in red. When we flip the gradient the other direction, the red ones are the ones precessing faster, and we can essentially make up that difference. How does that differ from the 180 degree? Okay, well the 180 degree RF pulse is recovering what? Dephasing due to what phenomenon? Due to innate variabilities in the static magnetic field. Now, the, those variabilities in the static magnetic field depend on the physical location of those spins and the molecular environment that they are in. We, don't, we can't predict that, but we know that they are constantly going to process with that difference. So the 180-degree RF pulse will allow them to make that up themselves. With the gradient magnetic field, we're essentially, in a sense, creating that sort of T2 prime effect deliberately with the gradient. Since we did it, we know exactly how it happened, and we can just reverse the effect. Okay. Then why not do that every time? Why not do what every time? Why not any time you apply the gradient? That's exactly what we're doing. Okay, but sometimes we don't. I'm sorry? Sometimes it seems like we don't apply. Okay, well, in fact, we have an example of that right here. Notice that I don't have that on the phase encoding gradient. Why not? Exactly, because that phase shift is the spatial encoding. If I, don't, if I correct that phase shift, I've essentially removed the spatial encoding from the image. So the phase encoding gradient will never have what we call a rephasing lobe on it. That would defeat the whole purpose. What about the frequency encoding gradient? So you'll notice that, and the way I've done this here, I'm a little bit out of space. So let me just redo something to give us some room. Yes? So the way I've drawn it here, it is a greater magnitude but a shorter duration. So it's essentially, right, the area under that curve or under, is, is what gives us the total effect. So the magnitude of dephasing that occurs from a weaker gradient applied for a longer time will be the same as a stronger gradient applied for a briefer period of time. So we don't want to waste a lot of time with this. 
So we will just turn it on at a higher amplitude for a briefer period of time. Yes? Does it also dephase the spins in slices that are or in areas that are not within the slice? Does that give you Well, a what is the state of the phase of those spins? So they're not in other slices. They're not excited. Exactly, meaning they have no coherent transverse magnetization in the first place. And we're hoping not to be detecting signal from there. So in a sense, if it would dephase them, that might even be a good thing. But they have no phase coherence to start with. Okay? Even though those, like, there's no overlap, there's no There is no overlap. What do you mean by that? Meaning, like, you have a slice and you're applying this 90 degree RF. You have a slice selection and you're applying this 90 degree uh, a ref pulse, which is B1. But that B1 must also affect s small areas, small uh, hydrogens adjacent to that slice. No? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your question. Then I'm, I have to rephrase. I have to think about how you rephrase that. How I, rephrase. I have to rephrase the question. Okay. Okay. So let me just draw this a little bit differently here. Okay, so we have our 90, our 180, our TE, right, which is the center point of our sampling time. The 90 and the 180 are both slice selective. And we have these rephasing lobes on those slice selection gradients. Our phase encoding gradient does not have any rephasing lobe because that dephasing is our spatial encoding. Is that clear what I just said? No, you say it again. So the phase encoding gradient, just like any gradient magnetic field, causes some loss of phase and therefore loss of signal. These gradients also cause dephasing and loss of signal, and we turn them on in the opposite direction to recover that signal. We're not interested in recovering the loss of signal due to dephasing from the phase encoding gradient. Why? Because the whole purpose of the phase encoding gradient is to cause that loss of phase. Exactly. Okay? Yes? Yes. So I drew these. With a bunch of lines here. That's just to show you that you're going to iterate this multiple times at different strengths. Okay, also you'll notice that these gradients are generally drawn as trapezoids, not as squares. That actually has meaning. It's not just aesthetics. Because it takes time for the gradient to get to its full amplitude. Okay? It's not instantaneous. And higher amplitude may take more time. Yes. All right. So, so we've talked about slice selection and rephasing those slice select gradients, why we don't rephase the phase encoding gradient. So I want to look now at what's going on with the frequency encoding gradient. Now, the frequency encoding gradient that's turned on during sampling, like any other gradient magnetic field, would lead to a loss of signal. As soon as we turn on this gradient magnetic field, which we must have on, because it is what causes our spins to process at different frequencies based on their location along the frequency encoding direction. But at the same time, since they precess at different frequencies, we're going to be causing loss of phase and loss of signal. 
So is there something we can do about this? Well, if we just turned on a rephasing lobe over here, it wouldn't really help too much because we've already acquired the signal. It's too late. So that's not an option. But what we can do, instead of trying to recover it after the fact, which is what we've done with the slice select gradients, is try and preempt this loss of signal. And this is what I mean. If sometime before we get to TE, we turn on this same frequency encoding gradient for a period of time, what's going to happen? Well, those spins will process at different frequencies based on their location. There will be some loss of phase, and as a result, less net, net transverse magnetization and loss of signal. When we then come time to start sampling, if we turn that on again, instead of destroying signal, we will actually be recovering what we destroyed before. And the net effect, by the time we get to TE, will be that there has been no aggregate effect on phase by these gradients in the frequency encoding direction. Someone's shaking their head. Okay, why does it have to be opposite? Okay, excellent question, which we will address. But before we do that, conceptually, does everyone follow what I'm saying? That we destroy some phase so that we can bring it back later. No? Okay. So we generate the signal, Jane, okay? And we have this signal in the transverse plane. And I turn on a gradient magnetic field. That gradient magnetic field makes our signal shrink because spins are adjacent to each other, seeing different field strengths, process at different frequencies, and lose phase. Mm -hmm. If I then turn on, and before we'll, we'll get to your question in a second, if I turn on that gradient magnetic field in the opposite direction, all of a sudden, the spins that were moving faster are now moving slower and vice versa, and they'll catch up with each other. So I initially caused some dephasing, and then I cause that dephasing to come back with the second application. Does that make sense? Okay. So the question is, it would seem from the way I just described it that I made a mistake, which is always possible, right, that it should look like this. A lot of people look at this and it's a lot easier to understand that way. But there's a complicating factor, which is the 180-degree RF pulse, okay? Because remember that, well, let's, let's leave it that way. So we cause these spins to dephase. Let's use two colors. So this gradient magnetic field causes the green spins to precess faster. Then we give a 90 degree RF pulse. If we turn on the gradient with the opposite polarity, this time it's the red ones that are going to precess faster. And we're actually going to lose more phase. Okay? On the other hand, if we do it the way I initially placed this here, Right. The first time around, our red spins will precess faster. We give the 180 degree RF pulse and we apply the exact same polarity of the gradient, which means it makes the red ones accelerate again and brings them back into phase. Okay? Is that clearer? Now, one other fine point here, and then we'll, we'll take a break for a minute, is that the timing is always designed to be such that we maximize our signal at the center of our sampling time, at TE. What that means is that the balance between the amount of 
phase change caused by the first application of the frequency encoding gradient and the second one is actually a balance between this and this. Because we want to maximize right, the recovery of what we've lost here at the center. So what that means is if we look at the phase changes resulting strictly from the frequency encoding gradient, we will see if we looked at what was happening with this signal or what was happening with phase, there would be a loss, then it would plateau, and then it would rise, and then it would go down again. Is that clear why that is? This phenomenon that we destroy some phase and then we bring it back to peak at our echo time, but then it starts to go away again, looks very similar to what was happening with the spin echo. Right? When we looked at the spin echo, we said that signal was vanishing with T2 star, then we gave our 180 degree pulse and it started to come back up till it hit the T2 curve. And if we kept going, it would start to lose signal again. This time was the spin echo. This is an echo caused by the application of gradient magnetic fields. This phenomenon is called a gradient echo. Now this diagram shows us a spin echo pulse sequence. But what you're seeing is that in order to avoid signal loss due to the necessary application of these spatial encoding gradients, specifically the frequency encoding gradient, we've invoked this new process called a gradient echo. Now one thing to be aware of is that in general when you speak to people, don't tell them that there's a gradient echo in your spin echo pulse sequence because people don't talk about it that way. But we'll next talk about a gradient echo pulse sequence and you'll see that right, there's really nothing any different about what's going on here between a spin echo or a gradient echo pulse sequence. Right, so any questions about this? The signal is? I thought you said before that the signal here? was increased. Yeah. Is that not true? No. We're, we can never recover any signal that wasn't there in the first place. So what I'm showing you with this black line is the change in signal caused by our gradient magnetic field. So that gradient magnetic field, when we first turn it on, causes a loss of signal. When we turn it off, well, it's not on anymore, so it's not having any effect on signal. So there is no change in signal due to that gradient magnetic field. When we turn it on the next time, it causes first an increase and then a decrease in signal. But the peak here is the same as this level. Okay? So all this that we're looking at, um, when we first initially looked at the T2 and T2 star curves, is it the point where we're exciting from T2 star up to T2 at TE that we're kind of looking at on a microscopic level, or is it the entire curve of T2, like the transverse magnetization dropping back down as it's relaxing? This sounds pretty microscopic to me. <laughs> So I, I, I'll, hopefully I, under, yes, I understood your question. So. <laughs> Those are correct axes at least. That's the right curve. So, so that's T2 star? Right. Okay. And that's T2. Okay. So this point in time is when we generate our signal and there is some point in time over here when we sample our signal. And if we're talking about a spin echo, there's some point midway between those where we give our 180 degree RF pulse. And at this point in time, the signal rises. So I think you were asking like are we imaging at a 
point in time or are we looking at the whole thing? Right. And the answer is that the signal that we record and ultimately turn into an image is simply a snapshot of an instant in time as this process is going up. So as soon as we generate the signal, the signal is there and it is going away. It will vanish with a time constant T2 star if we don't do anything and just watch it. If we use a 180 degree RF pulse, it will vanish with T2 star, then recover somewhat, and then by the way it starts to decline again with T2 star. <laughs> So you can choose whenever you want to sample the signal, right? but it has to be at some moment. Okay? And just one second, just to clarify, when we do our imaging and we said that we have to iterate this again and again to fill up all of our lines of case space, every time we do this we always sample at the same point in time. That way all of the signal in here is capturing information about the same moment during this relaxation <laughs> process. Okay, does that, you had a question? Yeah, if we're doing T1 imaging, we'd want to minimize T2, right? The T2. We uh, want to minimize the contribution of differences contribution in T2. Of T2. Right, so why would we give a 180 degree pulse that would raise the T2 contribution from T2 star to T2? that would raise the T2 contribution. I'm not sure what you mean. Well, the curve shifts up, right? So right. there's more signal coming from T2 compared to T2 star. Okay, so I, you may be confusing two different things. One is the signal amplitude, right? right? But the other is contrast. So when we, when we talk about an image that is T1 weighted, let's say, that is telling us something <coughs> about, right? Is telling us something about the contrast in the image, meaning that if we have a scenario like this where we have two different tissues that relax at different rates, okay? If we make our TE relatively long, Let's say we make TE over here. There is a sizable difference in the signal that we detect from those two tissues. And we therefore say that there is a contrast between those tissues. They have a different signal amplitude that is a function of the fact that they have different relaxation times, T2. T2, T2 star, whichever one it happens to be. If we make this TE much earlier, then there's a very small difference there's less contrast as a function of the difference in T2. The tissues have the same difference in T2, but we don't see it in our signal. That's a function of, you know, when you measure the signal. Whether you're measuring T2, T2 or T2 star, it doesn't really matter. All right, this is a function of the difference in signal between two different tissues, not between two different relaxation times. In this example, I'm talking about the same tissue that we can measure its T2 star relaxation or its T2 relaxation. But contrast is a function of two different tissues and how much of a difference in signal you get based on the fact that they relax at different rates. Is that clear? And the main reason that we use a spin echo when we generate an image that we would call a T1 weighted image is simply signal to noise because whenever we measure the signal, right, whether it's very early or very late, we're always going to have more signal available to measure if it's a spin echo than if it's a, if, I mean, if we don't use a spin echo. Okay? Yes. Um, is TE experimentally determined for what is the optimal time to get that the highest signal or is it different every time or well T is being used to modulate contrast now that being said it also has an impact on signal so the shorter you make your TE the higher 
the amount of signal you'll have in your image. And we'll, we talked about this before, we'll revisit it again this afternoon. But at the same time, TE is modulating contrast. So when you say experimentally determined, there's sort of no absolute right or wrong. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Is it on a study-by-study -study basis that you pick TE? So, in general, if you're running a scanner, you'll have a set of protocols where you know that when you image the brain, let's say, that we generally use this set of pulse sequences with this set of parameters because we know that we get optimal image quality using these settings, including specific TE. So it's not like every time you put the patient in the scanner, you need to figure out what the TE is. But at some point in time, someone did have to sit down and say, if I'm going to image the brain, let's figure out which TE, given all of the other parameters, because these things all interact with each other, which TE is going to be optimal. And that won't be the same as when you're imaging the knee or the liver or whatever it happens to be.